Now, we're on that sixth chapter of Mosiah. And this is why, usually in the second or third week, a good portion of the class drop out. They just don't like it. And uh, you'll see why. This is a marvelous chapter, and it's going to tell us an awful lot. But first of all, because the sixth chapter, I mean, we come to the seventh chapter now. But the Book of Mormon tells us things we don't like to be told. If it told us all, only what we wanted to hear, of course, we wouldn't need it. But that's the only part of the scriptures we're willing to accept. Well, here we go. Now, notice this last verse of chapter 6, before we get to chapter 7. What a strange economy this is. King was I, who's king of Zarahemla, who is an Ephite, not a Zarahemlite. He had caused his people they should till the earth. I would say that was an agrarian society, wouldn't you? And he also himself did till the earth. The king goes out and plows. That thereby he might not become a burden to some of to his burdensome, excuse me, to his people. That he might do according to that which his father had done in all things. His father had done the same thing. He's keeping the rule his father laid down in all things. His father see, here you have, as we said the last time, the the organic constitution of the land, and it remains. The constitution of, of Benjamin and Mosiah remains right to the end, and the great rival to it, of course, is that of the Nahors. But here, he done as his father done in all things, including cultivating the earth. He wanted to be like him in that too. And there was no contention among all his people for the space of three years. That's as long as, as Benjamin was alive. Benjamin lived for three years. So what's going on here? What kind of a, what a strange economy this is in which everybody lives by the sweat of his brow. This was Adam's economy, too. He didn't live in the stock market. He lived by the sweat of his brow. But should the king be doing that sort of thing? Well, why not? That was Brigham Young's ideal. Everybody would spend two or three hours in the field a day. That would be plenty if we all worked. And then we'd have time to do the things for which are here, namely improving our minds, he says. That's what we should be doing. But Adam's economy, both in the garden, where he's told to dress and keep the garden, and out of the garden, where he was condemned to all the days of his life, you see, to toil and sweat, and, uh, and by the sweat of thy brow, he, sh he should earn his living. And are there such societies? Well, yes. Anciently, the king always cultivated with everybody else. Remember old King Laertes? And that is a light. Well, I'm going to turn this. Oh, that's a light one, too. I'm going to put these dark glasses on, just as sure as you're shooting them. <laughs> All right, now. that's much better. They don't like it, and I don't blame them, but enough is enough here. You see, I still, in my old age, I still have use for my eyes, and I don't want to get them all shot now. So now, old Laertes, I say, remember, it tells us how he toiled in the vineyards on the fields, old King Laertes, on the hillside in the sun and so forth. They used to think if the king didn't cultivate the field, things wouldn't grow. That was a, that was a very important, uh, that was a, we see that lots of folklore about that sort of thing. And these are the normal societies. They pervade throughout the earth. The other societies are expansive and acquisitive, as ours is, and destructive. They're necessarily destructive. We know we destroy as we go. Now that we're getting accustomed, we might take these. Oh, that's awful. Well, I'll just look down shyly then. <coughs> And uh, so we have Aristophanes and Thucydides describing how it happened. Aristophanes wrote a long list of plays, all criticizing the transition of Athens from its old-fashioned, quaint, agrarian society to a new, aggressive, expansive business society. And it's biting satire. And then, if you want clinical analysis that belongs very much in our day, remember, this is the first thing General Marshall said to all his... Uh, George Marshall, remember the... the uh, <laughs> chairman of the board during, during World War II. He, he was a great general, a great man, but he always had them start out by reading Thucydides. It happens when we get expansive and ambitious and, and this sort of thing. And uh, the utopian ideal uh, <coughs> was tried, because it didn't work in this country. Remember, uh, we're talking about where everybody works in the field and so forth. With Latter-day Saints, it worked, but when they tried it with the Amana Society, or Robert Owen, these idealistic societies, utopians, they didn't work because the people were just factory workers that had just decided to get away from it all and go back to the soil. 
They weren't accustomed to it. It wasn't their way of life. But this is a way of life that is extremely ancient. We find these fields in Britain now. The new, there's a new collection of, of photographs, air photographs of Britain. It just came out by uh, a person called uh, Richard Muir. And uh, it shows fields, solid cultivation way up to the north, way up into Scotland, uh, 4300 BC. The, the real heavy agriculture began about 3800 BC. Now that's 6800 years ago. That's l longer than, uh, that's older than Egypt or anything else. They were cultivating. And the fields are still good. Well, for I was on a mission in, in, in Germany, I was in Baden, in, in the Black Forest and so forth. They'd been cultivating. I was near Micklesburg. I walked by Micklesburg every morning for a while and I went out to the villages to my trusty bicycle to try. But, uh, the roads were so worn that they would go down 10, 15 feet, and the, the trees, the roots would grow together over them. So in wintertime, you just walk through a tunnel there. Those roads were so ancient. Uh, the Micklesburg civilization around there, it's left its, its remnants, uh, is so old that, uh, well, it, go, it goes back to the, the upper Neolithic. It's very old, and the pots and pans are, uh, and then bell beakerware and that sort of thing. But the soil was still fertile. This is the point. After those thousands of years, they were still planting. Because they didn't waste anything. They didn't use chemical fertilizers either. Some of these. They had the way of doing it. And when they took across the river there in the Vosges, there was a continuation of it. And they took a, uh, these pots and pans and they scraped what was being cooked in them. They scraped out of the bottom and analyzed it. And it's the very same soup that the peasants make there today. For all those thousands of years, they've been doing a stable civilization. See? Now, stable civilizations, you say, are they dull? Uh, no, they're not. They're much more interesting than the others, they're much more interesting than the primetime TV. Uh, now, in these next chapters, I'm, I often refer just to those coming today, when, if we get on to them, I refer to the Hopi because they give us a good standard to judge by here. Theirs was such a society. There was absolutely stable. Sister Teresa Harvey's house was the first house that was was measured by the tree ring method. When, when it first began, she lives in a house out on the point at Walpi on the first mesa there, and she was the one who revived the, the old pottery custom because there was a lot of pottery dump outside her, right, right on the edge, you go to the edge of Walpi and then it drops right off. <coughs> there was this ancient pottery there and she started making pots, putting the designs of the pottery on. It became a big thing and they, she revived, uh, very responsible for reviving the ancient pottery. But her house was 1,100 years old and been just inhabited there. And these are, city, these are urban civilizations. They call their villages cities, the 12 villages. And the thing is just about on the same scale we find in the Book of Mormon. This is surprising. You mustn't think of these cities as something like <laughs> Pittsburgh or Chicago or something like that. They were not. This is very, by our standards, very small stuff. But everything that's said here would apply very well there, and you can use them as a, as a good yardstick, too. Uh, but life is not dull there. You see, every weekend, every weekend they have a grand blowout. They have the da a dance every weekend, and then, of course, in November it ends with the Hemond dance, but then it begins in March, again, 15. In the meantime, in the winter, they cheer themselves with all sorts of things, and, and this is very ancient. I'm, I'm tempted to recite Catania's speech from Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> Because this describes exactly what happens when the people fail to observe the ancient rituals and the dances and so forth, and all nature is in rebellion against them uh, because they're wrangling and fighting among themselves. I don't know whether I... Well, yeah, we'll get on with the lesson. As, as a wonderful line, though, the, uh, tells them where she says what's happening because of the people are not doing things as they should and now they're becoming mean and ambitious and overreaching each other. Now the opposite end of the scale is that which we've reached today in the MBA. And here's an article from the last Business Monthly, called, yeah, Business Month, December 1989, 88, last one. Years. It's talking about the MBA program. It's the nearly unanimous views of executives. Now this is the opposite extreme of that other civilization, that agrarian, stable civilization I'm describing, which I attempt to show later on is not a dull form of life. It is nearly unanimous view of the executives that MBAs are lacking in humility, humor, and humanity. All values attributed, are all valued attributes for executives. A poll of 480 chief executives were, were asked that, and they agreed on it. One of them says, those young people seem to be intent on destroying each other to get to the top. Now, you're not going to have a stable and enduring civilization on that. that there's no, no survival value in this sort of behavior. They are, 
I've been watching MBAs in the business for 20 years, the president partner of Lazare Frere and Company. MBAs in the business for 20 years, I've found the great majority of them immature in their judgments, inclined to make strong judgments without background of experience, ill-mannered, rude, brash, impatient, condescending. This is a nice generation coming up, isn't it? <laughs> I have a son-in-law who was very active in, in the program at MBA, the Harvard program at MBA, and he left it. He said they could think of nothing but money, and that, that was very jarring. Rude, brash, and condescending. Uh, the list goes on and on, it says. And competition is the sine qua non of the MBA program. See, these were, were non-competitive, notice it says there, and there was no contention among his people for the space of three years. Notice it didn't last too long either, we come to that too. But uh, contention, of course, there competition. There was no competition, no rivalry, no, well, no this sort of thing. That's the sine qua non of MBA programs. There is fierce competition to get into the best programs. A placement director for a major MBA program asserts, if our students don't look out for themselves, no one else will. In fact, they can count on other people taking advantage of them if they don't get adva the advantage first. You see, do unto others, they will do you. Cooperation is a nice ideal, but cutthroat competition is what's real. And uh, this is the, the situation. So, so what do we get? Well, is this a Book of Mormon lesson? Look, it is. We just look slightly ahead here to, to Alma. We're gonna, there's a lot of this, but this is the nearest example. We write the first chapter of Alma here in the uh, 32nd verse. And you see the type of, of character this develops. Ooh, I'm getting much too far now I'm here. Yeah. <coughs> Indulge themselves in uh, uh, or sorceries, that's a shortcut, the sorceries. And in idolatry, in idleness, in babblings, envyings, and strife, highly competitive. See, envy, strife. Babbling, spread the gospel around, and so forth. You can injure a person that way. And the envyings and strife, wearing costly apparel, you must dress for success, that is a must. <coughs> what are they doing? <coughs> Lifting up in the pride of their own hearts, as it says these people are arrogant, ill-mannered, brash, impatient, condescending. That's pride of their own hearts. Lying, thieving, robbing, committing whoredoms, that's on the side, but it's, it's uh, de rigor. It's what you always get in the TV prime time and murdering, and all manner of wickedness. Well, that's the picture. That, that's the type, that, that's the alternative. That's the other civilization. And now I have some gems from last Sunday's paper that I'm going to show you. This is a treat. Suspecting massive fraud flaunts his wealth. Bogus brokers sell worthless Utah firms worldwide. Well, this suspect is quite a guy. He went up to Park City, and we're quoting here the manager of the White Star, uh, of, the, of the real estate company that sold it to him. He went up there and dropped at least a million and a half to two million bucks in the place in a fancy house at Park City. <laughs> if you drove down that road, you were going to see one of the most beautiful estates in Utah. I bet his gate cost $20,000, he said, and nobody knows where the money came from. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't it? This is not the same economy as the king working in the field by the sweat of his brow, so he wouldn't be a burden to his people. So no one would have to pay the price of his ease, but here, look at the people that go down the drain for these. And this is what the Book of Mormon is telling us about. While this emphasis on economy and so forth, it was never so in my day. We never thought, we thought this was fantastic. Long ago and far away, it was considered romantic. The missionaries always pushed the Book of Mormon as a romantic history or story of the Indians, that's all. We never saw any connections at all in this stuff, and you see what it is now. Therefore, woe be to the generation that understands the Book of Mormon. So this is what we reach today. The point when the fruit is ripe, is the cup full yet? Remember, the Lord says he will let it go on till the end, till the fruit is ripe. Then there's no, there's no point to let it going on any longer, it'll just rot after that. Or the cup is full, it can't be diluted or cleansed or anything else because it's full, and you just have to empty it now. And then, he says, it will happen. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the second coming. They bought and sold, they married and gave in marriage, they, they ate and drank, everything was normal, it was business as normal. And then it says in a single day, it hit them, the flood came and so forth. So, not that there wasn't preparation and warning before it, the prophets yelling their heads off, but uh, it will be this way. And this is the Book of Mormon, this is what it has to tell us. So now we start out with our story with chapter 7 here. King Mosiah, this can be very mixing up if you try to trace these people around, because a little later on in the account of Zenos, there's a flashback in this whole story of King Noah and so forth, all takes place long before. This takes place, you see. So it's not put in chronological order here. The person who, 
wrote this had to be very careful. They were juggling plates and records. And the chance of getting things mixed up and using the wrong names, dates, and places and so forth is very great here. You have, you have to sweat to, to uh, unravel it. But Joseph Smith never misses a point, never misses. It's, a mar it's quite a performance. See, King Mosiah sends some of his Mulekite subjects the people he sends are all Nulekites looking for what? They were looking for a colony that had gone out two generations earlier, not just before. <laughs> That's why they didn't know where it was. <laughs> what they took out, they left. But since then, everybody was dead from that generation. They didn't know, and after they were out of sight, who knew the direction they took? But they got lost and couldn't find this lost colony. But they thought it'd be a great thing because well, they remembered going out. Uh, it's being sent out and so forth. This was, but this idea of, of lost colonies, again, there is a common thing, you see. the. Uh, yeah, the story, uh, story uh, Bar Hebraeus, and you get that. Well, Oral Stein, lost colony. Eldad uh, Hadani was a Jew who uh, looked for the lost tribes of Israel, and he found lost villages, settlements of Israel all over the place. You can find them in China and so forth. All sorts of, well, Lost Horizons, you all know. Uh, not Heller Hillman's famous novel about that. It's, it's like, it's Hill something, isn't it? Hilton, yes. Uh, James Hilton's novel. Uh, lost horizons. Well, this, these lost villages, lost civilizations, and they not. Pinache, uh, uh, sto uh, an old French settlement way up in the Black Forest. That I practically discovered, of course, I'd been there for years, everybody knew about it. But they, from the 12th century, they were refugees from France that had gone up during the uh, persecution. But the best, of course, is the seven cities of Cibola, which became fabulous. They're down in the, in the Hopi country, uh, in uh, New Mexico, lost some, but they were lost, and everybody was hunting for them, because they're supposed to be made of gold. The Spanish brought them. Esteban and the others were looking for it. And anyway, they, it was a lost, and they lost, it says they couldn't find it. Now, let's see what it says about it. It, it pays to look at the text once in a while, doesn't it? <laughs> King Mosiah granted 16 of them, they're strong men, they kept teasing him about it. See, they wanted to go, they, it's this tradition, let's go, to, well, of course, it was romantic, it was exciting. So look at the people that want to, to go treasure, to go treasure hunting, they're a mile long off the Florida Keys or wherever it is. Uh, we see them now, they go out in their, their yachts and they uh, find Spanish gold, and the gold is, there is Spanish gold there, so you can't blame them for getting all excited. And also looking for gold and treasure hunting. Remember the great treasure hunting in Joseph Smith's time. He was accused of being a treasure hunter because he dug for somebody who was a treasure hunter. Well, anyway, he, uh, <coughs> these people wanted to go. And to the land of Nephi-Lehi to inquire concerning their brethren. That land of Nephi-Lehi wasn't the place where, from which Mosiah had set forth, the land that Nephi went to after. Because that, that migration was 460 years earlier. It had nothing to do with this, you see. It's something else. It was called the city of Nephi, uh, Lehi Nephi here. And their leader was Ammon. He was a strong and mighty man. And a descendant of Zarahemla. So these were a Zarahemla crowd, a Mulekite crowd that went. Descendant of Zarahemla, I see. And they didn't know the course to go because after all, it had been a uh, hundred years before that, they, that this had happened. Or a little less maybe, but just about. They should go travel in the wilderness to go up to the land of Nephi, Lehi, fourth verse you see. Therefore they did wander many days in the wilderness. Which day will we go? And of course these wanderings, you have, you know the stories of, of, uh, of Utah Valley and, the, and uh, Father Sarah and, uh, and others that went through. Uh, who, you know, the, uh, the, the Spanish who, who discovered Utah Valley and the like, but they wandered around and they got lost. And they found marvelous things here in the valley and the peaceful Indians had no intentions of fighting at all. Marvelous societies and they, and of course, uh, are expansive and it was, it was like Athenian imperialism, <laughs> Spanish imperialism came in and became very impressive, uh, oppressive because what they wanted was the gold. But uh, I'm not thinking of just Junipero Serra who was in California, of course, but the uh, uh, who was it who came down Spanish Fork Canyon? Escalante. Mm. Esteban. <coughs> I mean Escalante. Uh, Escalante. And, uh, and his companion. Well, companion. Escalante was a companion, wasn't he? The original father was. I'll think of it in a minute. But so they wander around and see it's a manner of, and how do we get home? And it's a great country for wandering. Not, not a very dense population. See, that's, that's a thing understood. This is what you call the macro criticism. Low population and a lot of territory. Well, it's still the case in places like Nevada and so forth. Well, anyway, they're going to look for this place, and they couldn't find it. They wandered all over the place for 40 days, but they did find something. Then notice the type of land they come to. They come to a hill north in the land Shalom. We now found it, the, which is north of the land of Shalom. Uh, Salam, what do you mean? Shalom, of course, means the land to the, uh, you face south, and it means the, 
the land to the east, Shalom, in, in Semitic languages, Shalom means east land. They go to the land of Shalom which, in which they pit, pitched their tents. But of course, the hill which is north of the land of Shalom, of course, Shalom can also mean secure, safe. And Haman took three of his brethren, see they park here, and when it talks about pitching on a hill, you get the idea that they weren't in the midst of mountains or anything like it, it was pretty flat country. If the hill was a landmark, which it was, we learn later on. Well, he takes three of his companions with very interesting names here. The names <coughs> were Malachi and Hillam and Ham. Now, we mentioned before that, uh, well, they came from half Manasseh here. We get Alistair, well, that's the coast isn't steep enough, is it? Well, we'll, we'll let that do. Uh, here's an island. Here is, here is the uh, Sinai. It goes down here. And then we come up here, and here is the, oh, we're much too far out. And here is the Dead Sea. It goes up to the Sea of Galilee here. And here is Jerusalem down here. It's far enough and see. And here is Amman up here. This is still, this is Amman. And, uh, and this is Jerusalem here. And Manasseh and half Manasseh, their tribe was out here when the Israelites received their, their allotments. Manasseh, and remember, Lehi is the tribe of Manasseh. They were out here in the desert. They were desert people. Remember, his, the people that went with them were, uh, the, the people was his, uh, was his, well, his cousin or, or relative, whoever it might be. And they had uh, anyone called Ishmael, as he would hardly be a Jew. But this, these were people of Ishmael out here. No, these are Arabs, Amorites, Ammonites, and Amorites. They were out here. And they have these typical types of names. And the names it gives are, if Lehi was from here, the, the uh, oh, I'm all fussed today. The Jeremites, the Jeremites, the Mulekites, Jaredites. <laughs> Monday morning's a bad term. <laughs> uh, the Mulekites uh, would be also most likely to escape. These were the people who were able to escape when Jerusalem fell, you see, as far as that goes. And so we get these interesting names. There is the name of, of uh, in fact, I just looked them up in the, in the big lexicon here. And uh, I remember what they were, easily enough. But uh, it gives some reference that are very interesting. First, a Malachi with a prophetic A. It's Aramaic from Malach, Melech, Melech, all mean the same thing, which means the king, lord, or ruler, a Malachi. The second, Helam, is a very good one because it's very rich. In Hebrew, it means healthy, but in Aramaic and, and Arabic, it's much richer. In Arabic, it's Hilm, uh, which means a close friend. Close friend, yeah, it's Helam here, you see. It would contract to Hilm in Arabic. Uh, and in Aramaic, it is Halam. In Arabic, it's hilm, it means a friend. It means strong, uh, uh, good-humored, close to one. Helm, helm means join closely to someone else. And of course, a derived meaning, the second form, means gather, gather humors, sleep well, dream. Of course, the Arabic word hulman, which is a dream, hulman halam. Uh, it's for a dream, but it's strong, good humor. It's a good name for a person, but it's an Aramaic name is the point. It's an Ammonite name, and so is Amalekai. And finally, we come to him which is interesting for two reasons. Of course, him is the first king of Egypt on the record. His name means warrior. It's always written just with an arm, two arms, one holding a club, the other holding a shield. And the first king of Egypt, that was an alternate name of him, was him. It means warrior, and it's, a, it's not an uncommon name. It means a warrior chief, a great warrior is him. But the other hand, I think the Amalekite name is a better one, the, uh, the, the other name. Ham, of course, was the father. It means father-in-law, of course, in all Semitic languages. And it is a popular Amorite name, so that's what it probably is. So we have these people, Amorites, these, these Mulekites going out looking for their, for their brethren and lost and can't find them. And they park near a hill, and he chose three of them to go down into town and meet the king. Now, they met the king of the people, and they meant to meet him. See, they wanted to fall into his hands. They didn't know it would be so unfavorably. But they had to take the risk, and it shows that the king was offended here by what happened. Because uh, he says, how do you have the nerve when I'm right out there to come right up to my city? When I was out scouting, you could see them, you see. And, uh, and he took them in. He, they were captured on the spot. Of course, they were clever. They wouldn't have been taken otherwise. But see how it goes here. Behold, he met the king of the people who were in the land of Nephi, the land of Shalom. They were surrounded by the king's guard at once. They're meanly surrounded and taken and bound and committed to prison. They're being very tactless or very careless. No, he meant to see the king. That's what he wanted to do. He had to get an introduction some way, as he tells us later on. And he was in prison two days. They took him out, took him before the king, and were permitted, or rather commanded, to answer a few questions. So here's IPW, interrogation of prisoners. 
a thing in which I was supposed to be very much trained, but was never any good because I couldn't intimidate anyone. <laughs> uh, well, that's true. If you have to be able to intimidate them, I couldn't do it. So it something else. And he said to them, I had, I had a friend who was, he owns the largest importing bookstore, uh, bookshop in, in New York, uh, Lucien Miller. He, he was very thin, small, but he was a schoolmaster, very schoolmaster. He could scare the daylights out of those prisoners because the schoolmaster had always been the one they feared most of all. And he would just have to ask, look him in the eye and ask him a question. They'd, they'd spill their guts. They'd tell him anything. <laughs> but I could threaten and swear and stamp back and forth. they just laugh. <laughs> <laughs> he said to them, behold, I am Limhi. Now, here is another of those tricks, one of those micro critical points, you see. I am Limhi, the son of Noah, who is the son of Zenith, who came up out of the land of Zarahemla. Zenith, he's the third generation. Uh, we go backwards. Uh, Zenith's son, Limhi. Uh, well, Zenith, Limhi was the son. He is Limhi. His father was Noah, and his grandfather was Zenith. And it was Zenith who came out of Zarahemla, as he says. Zenith is another very interesting name, another Ammonite. Oh, that's a very good name, because this is exactly where it is. Now, you go up here, and you take the road and you go down into the Jauf here and you get over to uh, and you get over to see the ruins at Baalbek and that's where Odenathus in the year 270 Odenathus decided to revolt and make himself an independent king because his great queen was in charge and, and uh, the emperor Aurelian came and uh, and got rid of Odonathus and took Queen Zenobia. But know the word Zenob, Zenab. Zenith is a very popular name in that part of the world. And Zenobia is a feminized form of it, of Zenafi. And they, uh, well, they took her to Rome and she was paraded to the streets uh, wearing chains of pure gold. And that was supposed to flatter her, I suppose. But the name Zin Zainab is still popular among the Arabs. Zainab is quite a popular name. It's, that's a diminutive, it means little, little Zenith. And uh, so Zenith belongs there too, now that you mention it. And uh, this is another interesting one. Limhi, the son of Noah. Okay. Who was, what is Limhi? Of course, this is a, a dialectical form of Lamech. Limhi. Again, one of, those, uh, one of those diminutives and so forth. And who was Lamech? He was the father of Noah. We have a, a family tradition or gen uh, something in here that they, the father and son should be the name of father and son, Noah, and his father, Lamech. And it's the other way around here. I'm Limhi, the son of Noah, but there's the name Lamech. Come on. You notice, you notice the dialectical changes that go on here. Who came out of the land of Zarahemla to inherit this land, which was the land of their father. So they look back, the first Mulekites. These are all Mulekites he's talking about, not Nephites and was made king of the, by the voice of the people. That they, unfortunately, they had moved right smack into, into uh, Lamanite territory. The Lamanites had expanded this time, and uh, remember, they'd, they'd all been here hundreds of years. Remember, there's only 11 years between their two migrations, and they'd been here, and this was now 406 years later. Made king of the, by voice of the people. Well, that was the Amulekite king, and that was the way the people had made, the people had made, uh, Mosiah, their king, the same way, even though he was a stranger. Well, the same way when you get Romanus made king. Kings were very often chosen. You mentioned the force, like George, like George the first, and well, William the first. Uh, he forced him to make him king. But no, there are others that were actually chosen that came in and took over. And people wanted them to be kings because they were. Well, the story of the knight errant who is chosen. You see, who comes in and and the people uh, choose him. And now I desire to know the cause whereby. Ye were so bold as to come near my walls when I myself was out there in plain sight, he says. He doesn't say in plain sight, but he says, I myself and my guards, were, we were outside the gate, we were on patrol, and you had the nerve to make so bold as to come near the walls. He wanted to get picked up was the point, but uh, the king didn't see that at the time. It looked like pure insolence as far as that goes. They could avoid him. It was at night, and they... Well, if it wasn't night, they were even more bold because they were quickly taken and captured. <laughs> Took no skill at all in that case. <laughs> but, uh, and now Ammon saw that he was permitted to speak. That's exactly what he wanted. I am assured that if you'd known me, then you'd be glad to see me. For I am Ammon, that's a good old name, a descendant of Zarahemla, a good old Mulekite name. I have come out of the land of Zarahemla to ask about our brethren, whom Zenith, aha, the king's grandfather, who Zenith brought up out of that land. That's Limhi's grandfather, you see. And so, and now it came to pass, after Limhi heard this, he, he, he exploded, well, cousin, how are you feeling, you see? Now I know that my brethren who in the land of Zarahemla are yet alive. Again, you see, if, if uh, Zarahemla had been a mighty city at the time they left it, he wouldn't be worrying whether they would survive or not. It was a very small affair, 
hanging on probably by the skin of their teeth. And now we'll rejoice, and on the morrow I'll cause all my people shall rejoice also. As I said, the Hopis have, every week they have their, their dance and their celebration. They, they come from all the 12 villages, it'll be in one village. We'll host it one, and then, then another, the other time. The whole nation, they all come together. Everybody, no work, nothing like that. They have a high old time. And it's a very solemn affair. I mean, those costumes, there can be nothing bought, nothing artificial, nothing cheap. The, the colors all have to come from the berries and the minerals and the feathers and so forth, the Macaw feathers, have to come from Guatemala. Very interesting. What do they hope he's getting their Macaw feathers from Guatemala because they're forbidden because of psittacosis from crossing the border. But they go down and get them. It's another story. You'd be surprised the connections here, showing where they came from. See, to make, uh, at the spring dance, to, to make things official, they have to wear Macaw feathers and they have to be real. And they have to be fresh all the time. This is important. So I say they have a great time, keeps them busy and, and occupied and happy between the long hours in the field. I am assured that if you had known me, and the way they stand, if you're, to show how it's the poorest land in the world, their agriculture, and as you know, if you've done it to, to, to Cyan, northeastern Arizona, that there's nothing there but sand. There's sand and then there's the mesas, but it's just sand. So what you do, you take a stick and you push five seeds of corn sacred number. You put five seeds of corn down about 20 inches. You push them down and trust that they'll, the groundwater will make them grow. And they do grow, but never more than about a foot or 18 inches high. Never more. And I've never seen a stock that had more than one ear of corn on it. That ear of corn was treasured. It was precious. They were taken and stocked, piled like wood in front of the house. Piled, everybody keeps track of every ear. They say if, if one of us has corn, we all have corn. But they've been able to live and live well. With hard work, yes, they don't mind that. All these years on nothing. They see they were pushed the the, law, the, the most out of the world place in the world, and the, they, they were the Mokis, the Hopis, the, the peaceful people. They were once the most terrible fighters of all. They were on these high mesas. When I first went down there <coughs> years ago, you still had to get to first mesa by ladder, one side of it, and then, then they put a road up, and everybody started driving off and getting killed. But. Uh, <laughs> but it's amazing that they could not only survive and be happy, but go on for thousands. And, well, they came up from the south. They, their story, they, they tell how they got from the south. Now, that's another thing. Now, wait a minute. We don't, well, this is another thing about getting lost and so forth. We'll, because the story of their wanderings is very important. They keep a record of their wanderings. They came up from the great red city of the south when it was destroyed see, because of wickedness. The Zarahemla of the south, because Zarahemla means red city, you know, Dara Hamra. And uh, Zara, Hamra means red, feminine for him. Uh, Ahmar, Ahmar is red, feminine is Hamra. And Dara, Zar, is a settlement, a settlement or a colony or community. And you say Zara Hamra, that means the Red City. But anyway, that's coincidence. I don't know whether there's anything to it or not. But uh, it's good, clean fun to engage in these things. And uh, they say they came up from the south, up the long little Colorado, and they, they tell about their wanderings and so forth. And they kept the record, and thereon hangs a tale. Well, so that's that, he says. And he was exceeding glad. Behold, we are in bondage to the Lamanites. He had walked into a Lamanite trap because the Lamanite king welcomed them in with open arms and sold them the land and settled them down this beautiful acreage and so forth. And immediately they were paying for it through the nose all the rest of their days. Uh, happens, you see. For it is better that we be slaves to the Nephites than pay tribute to the king of the Lamanites. See, they knew that uh, these people were, were a, they were set out by a Nephite king, by Mosiah. They represented the Nephites. See, now, Mosiah brought quite a crowd with him too. And Zarahemla, though it was a Mulekite city, uh, was a Nephite government. The Nephite, uh, they recognized the superiority. This is a very common thing, but where you have two civilizations come together, the superior one takes over, just uh, understood as far as that goes. Well, of course, there's your Norman French and the Saxon, the Normans and Saxons in England. The <coughs> and now King Limhi commanded his guards that they should no more bind Ammon or his brethren, and they should go to the hill and bring their brethren back. And you see what kind of country it was, because they'd been there waiting, wondering what happened to the, th the four men that disappeared, but they'd suffered humber hunger and thirst and fatigue. They'd been looking around for something to eat and for water. They were thirsty. So it wasn't a, a lush jungle or anything like that, with plenty of fruits growing in that. It may have been pretty far north. Central Mexico, something like that. The territory, the whole scene reminds us very much uh, it's our Pueblo Indian society who have real settlements, permanent cities, I mean, I mean. Uh, and uh, they had suffered many things, hunger and thirst and fatigue. And King Limhi sent a proclamation among all his people again. Now the king is the chief. They use the same words interchangeably. It doesn't make any difference here. Together to the temple to hear it. And of course the temple is the center of everything. 
That's the, that's the kiva, and it's a real temple. They're built, the temples of the Hopis are built like the temples of South America. They have stairways going up on either side. The best ones are in, in Hota Villa, and uh, that's the center of everything. Everything takes place there. I mean, this, is, this is the thing, and it's, it's, it really quite surprised you if you go sometimes. There's the first spring festival, the 15th March, which is all by moonlight and at night, and it's... Uh, because it's so exactly following the Egyptian rites at the same time. It just everything about it. They have Wooty who comes out, marches the men that march on either side of her and the whips and all the rest of it. It's amazing the way these things go. But they're highly developed civilization here. And then, and so they'd been there, and they came, they gathered themselves together, and the king gave them a speech and told them what was happening here. Be comforted, our brethren still existing and so forth. Lift up your hearts and rejoice. Put your trust in God, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're going to celebrate, they're going to dance, you see. Cause that they should walk through the Red Sea. They know these traditions because re the Mulekites, uh, like the, uh, they know about them, if only because King Benjamin, uh, who, was a, uh, who was a Nephite, had had this long range and taught the people and was a great antiquarian and forced his sons to learn Egyptian and this sort of thing. So they knew all about the tribe, but they would, they would know that anyway as, uh, as people living east of Jordan there. Because our iniquities and abominations, he's brought us into bondage. That's the old story. Ye are witnesses this day that Zenith, who was made king over this people, he was overzealous. He's going to tell us his story a little later on. You see. Zenith was overzealous to an hour. Don't, let, don't be overreached, you see. It was his greed here overzealous to inherit the land of his fathers. By the cunning of King Laman, he, he, he sized it up. And they made a treaty, they signed, he, he signed on the bottom line, and took possession of, of the, uh, having yielded up into his hands, he gave him part of the land, called the land Nephi. Notice their city-states, the land, or the city of Nehi Nephi, because every city, every village has its, its round, surrounding it, and you know that's the city-state of antiquity, until the time of Lehi, when they broke up and became more empires. And one overtook the others. He was in the time, exactly in the time of Lehi, that we find all this expansiveness, all this colonizing and exploring, and this is the tradition here. All this he did for the purpose of bringing people into bondage. He had a clever, just like the sharecroppers, you get half of it, and now you're stuck for the rest of your life. And treating in a trick. Good examples in Caesar's Gallic Wars have, at the beginning, uh, or the Torix, uh, he makes such, with, with, he makes such uh, treaties with uh, tribal chieftains or kinglets in Gaul. He's in Switzerland. All his people move out because the valleys are too close for them. And they make these, and before you know it, he's taken over. He's taken over, taking advantage of the contracts and so forth. Some wonderful stories in Caesar about this tribal way of uh, playing the game with each other. And so they had to pay him one half of their corn. And uh, one half of all we have, as far as that goes. And so the blood has been spilt in vain because of iniquity. All this, they, they rebelled against them and tried to get free, but it didn't work. Because of their iniquity, the Lord is going to keep them in bondage. And then there arose contentions among them. So they start shed, started shedding blood among themselves. And this is the old story. This is the story of the Indians, as far as that goes. After peaceful, they all start fighting each other, tribal wars, and contentions among themselves. So they did shed blood. And a prophet of the Lord has they have they slain, because he said unto them that Christ was God, the Father of all things. Well, why would he do a thing like that? He said that God should come down among the children of men. And this, of course, when Jesus said that, uh, they stoned him too. But here, the, uh, what was I trying to think of here, um, not just Christological controversy, that the, uh, uh, was that enough provocation as far as that goes? Oh yes, it was enough provocation. You've got to watch yourself, you see. They have two societies, the Zunis have them as well as the Hopis. The one horn and the two horn. The two horn act as a benevolent spirits and go around and do what good they can to people and help things, people out of trouble and so forth. But look out for the one horn. Everybody, they're the dangerous ones. If you do anything that's the least bit out of line, there is just one solution. And believe me, they take care of it. It's the end. They, they kill people for it. And this is exactly the sort of thing that the, the one horn society would do if he said something that was out of line. A prophet would say anything that God should come down among the children of men. Wham! That's it. And uh, this. Uh, there's quite a tale behind this, too. 
And because he said this, they put him to death for that. Well, that's enough reason. Well, I'll, after all, I'll look at Persia today and under the Ayatollah. If a woman just raises an eyebrow or says something, bam, it's something like that. You get, you're a non-person or you're killed. Just the slightest sign of disaffection and rebellion. And, and that happens. And we've seen dictatorships in which that's so in our day. It's not exaggerated. A person who shows the slightest sign of dissension or disagreement is in real trouble. Well, the prophet, you went around yelling about things. That would got him out of the way. So these people are being punished for it. And again, if my people shall show f slow filthiness, so filthiness, they shall reap the chaff thereof, the whirlwind. That's pollution, is filthiness, and so forth. That's an Old Testament expression. And they shall reap the east wind. Well, and then the king. Oh, I see the time's nearly up now. In the next chapter, then, we've got to we go faster than a chapter of the time. We'll never finish the book this semester, will we? Uh, he caused Ammon to stand up before the multitude and rehearsed unto them everything that had happened. He told the story how they came up from, uh, went up out of the land uh, the same time he himself came. And they both compared records and compared their stories of what had been going on since. And he told them the last words of King Benjamin, which were very important, you see. And so that they might understand all the words which he spake. So he gives them the laws that Benjamin laid down. Uh, of course, his father, Mosiah, was a great lawgiver too. But this, these, I say, become the basic teachings. These become the, the standard uh, work for these people. And then he dismissed the multitude that everyone should go to his home. Notice by, it's by families, and they all go to their homes. And that's an interesting thing, too. Uh, though uh, societies like the Hopis are very communal, I mean, they share everything they have. And so they'll all get through. They have to. But a very family conscious. And of course, they're divided into seven clans. They have clans and groups, and you belong to clubs. And, and they're secret and have their own signs and symbols and so forth. And then, then you have the whole group. And then you have very strong feelings among uh, separate tribes and nations there. We'll, I see the time is up now. We'll go into that. And uh, yes, he t he's going to tell them how they went to sign the land of Zarahemla. So we'll end here. and. Resume the next time. Can you wait? Read the next chapter and see what happens. No, then it gets into the record of Zenos. Now, Zenos, this is a flashback. Zenos takes us way back to the time of King Noah, uh, who is his father. And he was a terrible man. His Noah was the, one of the worst characters in the Book of Mormon, and Zenos was a great man. So it goes to show you never know.